Hi, I'm Jonathan Stein, Managing Editor of Project Syndicate, and we're here today with Professor Joseph Nye of Harvard University. Uh, Joseph Nye is a university professor at Harvard. He's also a former U.S. Assistant Secretary of Defense and former chairman of the U.S. National Intelligence Council. Uh, professor Joseph Nye, welcome. Glad to be with you. Uh, you are, uh, I should say that you've also been a Project Syndicate monthly commentator since 2002, last but not least. And in your most recent column, uh, you offered what might be called a, a China Bears Manifesto. Uh, we've heard for years that uh, China is uh, growing fast. This year it's forecast to overtake the U.S. as the world's largest economy in purchasing price parity terms. Um, and you uh, pour quite a lot of cold water over, over this idea in your recent column. You point to um, a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, problems that, uh, that, if not overlooked, they haven't really been a focus of attention. And, uh, for example, uh, a weakness in financial services, a lack of economic sophistication, uh, a, a, a lack of, of, of world-known uh, uh, brands. Uh, you mentioned that uh, 17 of the top uh, global brands are, are American companies. Um, you also uh, mentioned the demographic problem. Uh, by uh, 2030, the number of elderly will outnumber the number of working age uh, population. Um, this all sounds very, very gloom and doom. Uh, is China, in fact, doomed? Uh, are they? Are they? Uh, are they? Is, is growth going to slow? Uh, markedly for a prolonged period of time, um, what can they do to maintain their momentum? Well, Chinese growth is going to slow because we know that uh, when countries have periods of high growth, eventually they have a return to the average uh, rates of growth uh, called regression to the mean. Uh, so yeah, it's going to slow, but I don't consider myself a China bear. I actually greatly admire what China has accomplished. I mean, it's raised hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, and I think it can continue to do so, and I wish them well to do that. What I'm trying to do in the column, and in general I'm writing a book now called Is the American Century Over? And uh, what I'm trying to do is resist what I call china or the euphoric view uh, that sometimes summarized China ruling the world. And that Financial Times headline quoting a World Bank unit that says that China will pass the United States this year in size of its total economy uh, in purchasing power parity, uh, that it, many people say, okay, that makes China the world's superpower or something. It doesn't. I don't believe the Chinese are going to catch up with American power overall until uh, three or four decades, if then. Uh, that's a lot different, though, than saying, will China be very close to the U.S., or will China be larger than the U.S. in exchange rate values of uh, the total size of GDP in a decade or so? Probably yes. But that's not the same as having an equally sophisticated economy or equal amounts of economic power. So I, I, I still remain uh, positive about China and future Chinese economic growth. I'm trying to resist the people who are seeing this as uh, China passing the U.S. in overall economic power or political power. Yeah, one of the uh, one of the interesting and I think fundamental points that you make is that in in per capita terms, uh, uh, the Chinese economy is only one fifth the size in terms of per capita income, uh, which which really is a, a very a very important point. And 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 uh, part of the characteristics of China's development have been really vast regional disparities in in wealth and income between the coastal areas which are uh, are booming and and uh, and inland areas um, China has gone on a real infrastructure boom in, in order to link up these uh, these areas is that enough is it to to, to integrate China more uh, economically? Um, and and uh, and where do you see the path of, of, of urbanization going in China? Can the cities of, of China uh, absorb uh, 
uh, so many people. Uh, you know, I was there eight years ago and and uh, 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 visited a city called Yi Chang, and I looked in my guidebook and it said that Yi Chang was a city of 500,000 people. But my guidebook was five years old, and in those five years, it had become a city of five of four million people. It had grown eightfold in five years. Is that kind of, of, of rapid urbanization sustainable? Uh, does does China have the the public services? Can it develop the public services fast enough to handle this kind of uh, this kind of of shift of of, uh, of population? Well, China is uh, planning on a major increase in urbanization. Yeah. I mean, it's still only halfway there, so to speak. And if they're going to eventually wind up some sort of a situation where most modern countries are three quarters to eighty percent or eighty five percent urbanized, they still got a good distance to go. I think they will. Um, I think the, the urbanization is probably uh, likely to be successful. It requires a lot of infrastructure, but they've been very good at building infrastructure. Uh, the that's an area where they, with state planning and large budgets they've done relatively well. Uh, they haven't solved a lot of other problems, which is being nimble, as I put it in the column. They're very good at making jobs, but not very good at making Steve Jobs. Right. And that uh, they're, you know, if you look at an iPhone and you ask the value added in the iPhone, it's listed as an export from China, but in fact, a very small part of the value added is in China. Most of it is in the United States or in the component makers from that China imports from. Uh, so there, China has a, a long way to go in the economy. But on the area of infrastructure and urbanization, I expect they're going to continue to do relatively well. The problem of inequality though, between the east of the country and the west of the country uh, and the southwest of the country is, is a real problem. Uh, and there's also enormous inequality uh, as you watch the the changes that are going on in the country as a whole. People are getting richer, but you're also seeing uh, increases in inequality. Uh, those are probably tolerable if everybody feels that uh, that they're getting better, but uh, it, it's accompanied by an extraordinary amount of corruption, which is very demoralizing. So. Inequality plus extreme corruption is, is I think, more likely to be a, a problem for them. And that's why Xi Jinping has now launched a major anti-corruption campaign. But that's not new either. Chinese leaders have used corruption as a tool against their political opponents for a long time. I think the big question for China in, in political terms is, as per capita income in countries gets around $10,000, in purchasing power parity terms, there's a greater demand for participation. You have more middle class people, more educated people. You can't rule them the way you can, let's say, a nation of peasants. And you see this in countries in the same region and the same similar types of culture like Korea, South Korea, and Taiwan. Um, and China hasn't quite figured out how to manage this. I don't think it means they're going to turn to a democracy that looks like a Western democracy, uh, but there are going to be increased demands for participation, which they haven't quite figured out. I w I, that was going to be my, my sort of follow-up question. You know, I'm, I'm sitting here in Prague, and yesterday was November 17th, the 25th anniversary of the start of the Velvet Revolution in Prague. and. Uh, uh, a few months before that, in 1989, was Tiananmen Square in in, in China, obviously the pro democracy movement, um, and it was crushed. And uh, it seemed that for a long time that uh, the uh, that Chinese were accepting the kind of trade off that the Czechs accepted after the Soviet invasion in 1968. We'll take economic comfort. Uh, just leave us alone and let us go about our business. Now, obviously, the Czechs were still under a centrally planned economy, whereas the Chinese have liberalized and people actually have grown wealthy. Uh, at the same time, uh, China has thousands and thousands of protests every year at the, at the local level. I, I, I read a couple of years ago that it was something like forty or 50,000. Well, I think uh, it's a couple of times that. 
is it? Is it really? They publish their own figures that put it up in over well over a hundred thousand. Now, is this is this completely locally based? It's a, a lot of it's about local government seizing land and so forth uh, for development. But um, do you do you see this coalescing into maybe a, a a Hong Kong style movement. Now Hong Kong obviously poses yet another threat to the to the to the leadership in in China, one that they have to manage very carefully. Um, could this spread? Could could these kinds of this kind of uh, uh, frustration, uh, hope, uh, desire for participation coalesce into some kind of broader movement in China? It's possible, and if you add to that the internet. Uh, which increases the, the ease of communication among these largely localized uh, disputes over land or local corruption and so forth. It's possible. I think the party is going to stamp on it very quickly. I doubt that you're going to see an organized protest. I doubt you're going to see another Tiananmen Square or, or even anything like uh, Occupy Central in Hong Kong because the party essentially has a police state apparatus right. which curtails this very early. With that said, however, uh, the party's legitimacy it rests on uh, not so much on ideology anymore. It calls itself the Communist Party, but it's not very communist. Uh, what it rests on is a high rate of economic growth, which is beginning to slow through natural causes, and on uh, nationalism, and to some extent on efficient government, though the corruption problem makes that uh, a dubious claim of legitimacy. Uh, so I think the, the party has got to figure out how do you uh, deal with these concerns if economic growth slows uh, and still maintains legitimacy. And that, I think, is a, is, is a problem for them. So it doesn't come out so much as a protest, but if you take the evolution of Chinese views on climate change and pollution, uh, air pollution, over the last decade, it's quite amazing how much they've changed. And partly it's because you can't breathe in Beijing or Shanghai. I mean, it's partly because citizens are annoyed. So uh, that is visible, present, uh, and the Chinese leaders have to figure out how do you deal with it. They're beginning to try to co-opt the issue by changing changing some positions, but it's not going to be easily solved. And the question, I mean, so you can organize, for example, a group related to climate without actually being stamped out by the party, whereas if you organized a group relating to freedom of speech, you wouldn't last very long. One of, one of the great paradoxes uh, in the region now is uh, growing economic inter interdependence between Japan and China. Uh, I think that China is now uh, the largest uh, trade partner for Japan. It, it, it's a, uh, one of China's major sources of uh, foreign direct investment is Japan. And yet, politically, uh, they are uh, at loggerheads. Uh, historical disputes are, 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 are overwhelming the relationship, uh, the, the diplomatic relationship. Uh, and, and obviously, China has disputes with many of its other neighbors. And I, so this leads to sort of a broader question: How can this economic inter interdependence in the region uh, be reconciled with the lack of a coherent regional security architecture? Uh, and uh, uh, how can China, the two largest players in the region, China and the U.S., find any room for reconciliation? I think China now feels more and more. Uh, locked out of regional security arrangements and, and, and economic arrangements. It, uh, it, it isn't a part of the uh, emerging Trans-Pacific Partnership mega-regional uh, trade deal. Um, what should leaders on both sides do? They, they, they've, they've, you know, they, this, this climate deal that, uh, that Obama and, uh, and Xi uh, uh, concluded in Beijing seems very hopeful. Is there room for more of this kind of uh, this kind of diplomatic progress? Well, there are areas where the U.S. and China have strong interests in cooperation. Uh, we often focus on competition, but on areas like climate, areas like maintaining international financial stability, questions like uh, pandemics and dealing with them in ways where they don't uh, spread uh, so quickly, 
Uh, these are all areas where the U.S. and China have common interests and it would be a pity to see that if the zero-sum or competitive aspects of a relationship locked out of uh, these cooperative dimensions. With that said, however, there are there are rivalries. I mean, China is claiming uh, the islands in the East China Sea that the Japanese call Senkaku, China calls Daiyu, uh, and there's been a, uh, uh, a real dispute there. Uh, though it has, I think, uh, in that the case is probably uh, going to be more manageable than the South China Sea, where you have uh, half a dozen countries that are claiming different features in the South China Sea within an area that China has enclosed what's called a nine-dashed line on the map, uh, which implies that they claim all the land features within that. Uh, and that's led to disputes with Vietnam over an oil rig, with Philippines where China took Scarborough Shoal away from them and so forth. And uh, it's very hard in, in some ways when you talk to Chinese officials or, or friends and you say, you know, by letting yourself get so wrapped up in these arguments over little reefs and shoals and so forth, you are uh, doing what you say you don't want to do, which is drive these countries into the Americans' arms in the security field. And you complain about containment, but this is what you might call self-containment as you act as a bully towards your neighbors, you're producing the policies you don't want. And so why don't you do something about that? And what I'm often told is when an issue rests on sovereignty, or what we see as our sovereign territory, that's a core interest and we can't compromise. And that gets them caught in a trap. If they want to increase their soft power, their attractiveness in the region, at the same time, uh, and they want to also increase the trade relations. Right. At the same time, uh, their behavior toward their neighbors uh, is they're limited at home what they can do about this by nationalism. Right. And uh, so they're, they're in a bit of a bind on this. And I think the, the, what we have to hope is that the economic interdependence does remain high. Uh, for example, in, on the issue with the Japanese about the Senkaku Dayu Islands, uh, the trade has, maintain, has been maintained fairly high, but Japanese investment in China has dropped quite considerably. Now, that's not just political, it's also because of, of looking for other opportunities where cheaper labor and inputs and so forth. But I, at, at the high degree of economic interdependence in the region is good for all of us and good for them. And uh, uh, the question is, can the Chinese restrain their actions toward their neighbors in the, particularly the South China Sea and East China Sea, in ways that uh, allow this economic uh, relationship to continue uh, without uh, disruption? Um, I think they're aware of this, but because of rising nationalism at home in China, it's hard for them to manage. I um I want to pick up on a on a, a concept that you just sort of tossed out and you've you, a concept that you've elaborated in international relations theory this idea of soft power versus hard power uh, hard power meaning military power military might uh, the ability to actually coerce others to do uh, what uh, what you want and soft power being a power of attraction for example you know Britain has the Beatles the Beatles yep. are you know, a, a very, a very, uh, a, you know, a, it a, attracts people to the culture. And the, one of the questions about China has been uh, its it, it soft power resources. To what extent it, it has uh, cultural attraction? Uh, and um, uh, clearly, the disputes in the region, its territorial disputes, are not helping uh, in the region. And yet, uh, elsewhere, we see uh, a good deal of attraction for this what some call a state capitalist model. Uh, and clearly there's attraction in Africa for, uh, for China mm -hmm. and, for the, and for the Chinese model, uh, with a lot of Chinese uh, inv investment coming in uh, that doesn't have the same strings as, 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 as the multilaterals impose very often on, a on African governments. Um, and so my, my question is this, is China, is, is soft power something, uh, it, it, can it be zero sum? Is China benefiting 
uh, in terms of the attractiveness of its economic model because the Western model of liberal capitalism has seen to have, not, if not failed, to have gone through a very severe crisis from which it hasn't yet recovered. Uh, and, 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 and China is simply benefiting from this, from the lack of an alternative. Well, China uh, has a lot to gain from increasing its soft power. Hu Jintao, former president, told the 17th Party Congress of the Chinese Communist Party in 2007 that China needed to increase its soft power, and it's been spending billions of dollars to try to do so. Uh, and soft power of a country often comes from culture or values or policies, and Chinese traditional culture is very attractive. Uh, it's attractive all over the world, but it's particularly attractive in the Asian region, where historically it's been very influential. Uh, China's then tried to increase the attractiveness of its culture by setting Confucius Institutes to teach Chinese language and culture. But it doesn't do you much good to set up a Confucius Institute in Manila, in the Philippines, for example, uh, if you're going to send your, your uh, uh, hard power ships right. to drive Philippine fishing boats out of Scarborough Shoal. Uh, that stimulates nationalism in the Philippines and makes China look less attractive. So that's one of the dilemmas China has for increasing its soft power. Uh, on values, uh, I think if, if you take something like authoritarian development, as you mentioned, people talked about a Beijing consensus replacing a Washington consensus, which is that you get high rates of economic growth plus, say, authoritarian political structure. Um, that is attractive. I, I imagine that's very attractive in Zimbabwe. It's not very attractive in Paris or in Ottawa or in. Well, it is. It is attractive in Budapest, apparently. Well, Budapest, I guess, is uh, is a little bit of an outlier in Europe, but by uh, under the current. Uh, uh, Victor uh, Orban, the Prime Minister. But, uh, but the, in general, uh, the idea that the world is being swept by a ideology, you know, of, of communist, uh, authoritarian, uh, high rates of economic growth, it's just not true. It's not like the Cold War where, where you, you know, you had in communism an alternative ideology or in the 1930s fascism that had an alternative ideology. Uh, the Chinese model is attractive in some places, but it's not sweeping the world. And it's also very hard for other countries to duplicate what China has done. They don't have the same degree of efficiency that no. the Chinese have. You know, 20, 20 years ago, we all heard that, uh, or many, many said that the Internet would would be the death knell of authoritarian governments. That this, the openness, the ability to communicate across borders, virtually if not physically, uh, would simply expose these regimes to uh, 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 pressures that they wouldn't be able to withstand. It, it hasn't really worked out that way. And in fact, um, uh, the internet can also be a tool of authoritarian governments and uh, is increasingly uh, seen as a threat, both in terms of non-state actors, groups like Anonymous, uh, but also states themselves. And you mentioned in an article in May that something like 30 governments are now known to have uh, offensive cyber programs. Um, and, and, and China is, is obviously one of them, and this has been a, a, a very uh, uh, large uh, bone of contention uh, between the U.S. and, and, and China. Um, how can the issue of cybersecurity be addressed or best addressed? Is the, is the solution multilateral, or, or should this be, uh, it, will this be inevitably something that's led by uh, major powers, which would mean Making coming to some kind of uh, modus vivendi with, with with China. Well, cybersecurity has many dimensions, and we shouldn't forget non-state actors uh, right. should often appear to be acting as though they're a state actor, and, and uh, attribution can sometimes be difficult. But just leaving, just sticking to the major states for a minute, uh, the question is: Can you get some rules of the road? Uh, uh, cyber espionage is practiced by all major states. Uh, the question is, can you get, as in the Cold War, where 
the, the both sides uh, practiced espionage, but there were sort of what was sometimes called Moscow rules. I mean, if you caught some spies, you expelled them, they expelled some in retaliation, but uh, there were some limits on how far it went. Uh, on cyber espionage, there haven't been rules of the road of that sort. The Chinese feel that there's nothing wrong with stealing intellectual property. Uh, the Americans say it's one thing to have espionage for defending the country or learning military secrets, but not for unfair competitive advantage. And there's some talk about the Americans and others taking this into the World Trade Organization framework, saying, you know, if you want fair and equal trade, stop stealing secrets of the companies that you're trying to trade with. And so there may be ways in which you can get it within a rule or norms-based procedure uh, by linking it to, a, to another issue. And then there are areas like uh, uh, on, on the military uh, offensive operations, you could imagine uh, getting agreements saying that uh, uh, you will not uh, place logic bombs in infrastructure of other countries. Um, and I mean, or sort of a, a limits on what types of targets would be acceptable. Now, they'll be hard to verify, and there are large numbers of difficulties with it, but uh, could you imagine something being done? Yes. And if you look at, um, are, there, are there rules of the road that affect uh, offensive uses of cyber instruments? Um, the UN's group of government experts uh, at its last meeting agreed that the laws of armed conflict, which talk about discrimination or proportionality and not targeting civilians that did apply to cyberspace. So we're in an early stage of, of developing norms, rules of the roads, but I'm not totally pessimistic about this. I wrote a paper on, for a commission that Carl built as chair of the Global Government uh, uh, Internet uh, Commission, Global Internet Governance Commission, and the uh, there I lay out some ways in which you might be able to think of different regimes for governance of cyberspace. But these we're in very early days of this. I mean, we haven't, you know, there there's some progress, but there's a long, long way to go. And in the meantime, the U.S. and China have found that uh, uh, an issue which has created enough disputes that they put it on their high levels of their bilateral meetings. For example, when Xi Jinping and Obama just met, at APEC, they resumed a uh, U.S.-China commission that they'd set up uh, to look at, uh, at cyber issues, and cybersecurity. Uh, the Chinese had suspended this after the U.S. had indictments against Chinese PLA uh, officials or military officers For who me. they thought uh, had been involved in this espionage. The Chinese had broke off this commission. Uh, the recent meeting of Xi and, and uh, Obama, uh, they agreed to set the mission back in, in progress. So there's, there is some diplomacy going on, but there's also uh, by no means a full agreement or even a major agreement on it. Okay. Thank you very much. You may be happy to know that uh, this is a plug for Project Syndicate that Carl Bilt will be joining us as a monthly commentary, uh, commentary in January. Um, uh, Professor Joseph Nye of Harvard University, uh, thank you very much for being with us today. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm Jonathan Stein, Managing Editor of Project Syndicate. Thank you for watching.